envisions. That is a big question mark. Paul, thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Out front for us next, new details on how Steve Bannon prepared for his White House exit and Bannon's return to what he calls his killing machine, Breitbart News. Plus, the reporter whose interview with Bannon infuriated the president just days before he was fired. And Democrats taking action, at least trying, against the president tonight. Breaking news, new details tonight about how Steve Bannon prepared for his exit from the White House. The new, the now former White House chief, chief strategist believed he put the pieces in place for his agenda to live on without him. That's according to sources close to Bannon. Those sources are also telling CNN that Bannon downplayed concern about his imminent firing, telling associates he would return to his, quote, killing machine, Breitbart. Late today, we learned that he did just that. And the sources say Bannon believed he would be even more powerful at Breitbart than he was at the White House. Out front with me tonight, Brian Lanza. He served as Deputy Communications Director for the Trump campaign. And Dan Pfeiffer. He served as Senior Advisor and Communications Director for President Obama. Obama. Great to see you guys. Um, so, Brian, in Bannon's mind, he was putting pieces in place to ensure that his agenda lives on beyond him. Do you think it does? Well, absolutely. I mean, his agenda is very much in concert with the president's agenda, and it's very much in concert with the with the electoral majority that, elect, that elected them in November. So, yeah, I mean, it's it's what the president has is now he has an outside player that's probably more effective at executing uh, his vision and the and the mandate. But uh, you know, it's just you know, it's, it's where we are today. It is surely where we are today. Dan, do you think um, with Bannon's firing, you're going to see changes in the president? No, we're not going to see changes. It didn't matter if Bannon was there. It didn't matter if he was in Trump's favor, out of Trump's favor. Like, I listened to that whole segment about the Javanka group, mm -hmm. Gary Cohn, Brian's previous, John Kelly. None of it has mattered. Trump is Trump. He's the reason the presidency is in shambles. He hired Kelly. It was supposed to be this big pivot point, And he just had the worst week of his presidency. So I don't, like, I think we can all stop with worrying about who's up, who's down in the Trump presidency. All that matters is Trump is there. And so if Bannon's at Breitbart or he's in the White House or whatever, I don't think it matters that much. Uh, but it's just too fun to talk about. Um, Brian, well, yeah, exactly. with, with, the, with the agenda <laughs> living on, as you say, there's also this. Bannon just told the Weekly Standard this tonight. Let me read it for you. He, he, wrote, he said this. The Trump presidency that we fought for and won is over. We still have a huge movement, and we will make something of this Trump presidency. But that presidency is over. It'll be something else. And there'll be all kinds of fights. And there'll be good days and bad days, but that presidency is over. What exactly is he saying? What does it mean? Yeah, I, listen, I think Steve knows how to get a headline, and he certainly got a headline with his quotes. But I think what it ultimately means is that, you know, the president arrived there with a mandate, with an agenda, and Steve was a part of that, and he felt that sort of the institutional powers here in Washington, D.C. have slowed that agenda down. And, uh, you, know, and you know, he's clearly frustrated, as with anybody who's frustrated, as with the millions of Americans who are frustrated, who expect a change in November and are still waiting for that change to take place. You know, that's, that's the situation, and it's, 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 it's a healthy process to sort of bring in new energy and new people and set up a proper structure so that we do complete the promises we made to the American people. So, Brian, you think it's a good thing that he that Bannon's out? I, listen, I, I, I don't want to say it's a good thing that Bannon's out. It's a good thing that we're turning the page and moving forward to the agenda that the people voted for. I think uh, there's there's distractions that don't need to be distractions, and let's, you know, let's at the end of the day, this presidency is about Donald Trump, and it's about the people who voted for him, not about you know any particular employee or anything like that. Tell that to Steve Bannon, Brian, next time we talk I, to him. I know Dan, Steve Bannon really well. I mean, he's going to work <laughs> in concert with was, this president. I'm playing, I'm playing, man. Okay. Dan, do you, do you see this presidency is over? <laughs> no. I Look, I, the, I read those Steve Bannon quotes, and I just laughed, because I don't know what fantasy he's living with in his head. He runs a website. And a mediocre one at that. He doesn't have some sort of army. He's a media player. That's fine. He's like, he's like in his mind, he's the leader of some populist movement. He's just a guy with a website. He was in the White House. He's out of the White House. And I can tell you one thing: having worked in the White House and been outside the White House, mm -hmm. you have much more influence inside. He got kicked out because he lost, he got fired, he lost favor. That's it. We can move on. And I don't think it's gonna. I actually just don't think this is gonna matter that much in the end. Brian. 
Yeah, I think he's right. I mean, we know what the president's agenda is. It's just a matter of getting all the staff moving forward in that. Bannon inside or outside, it doesn't change the mandate that the president was elected upon and what the people are expecting. I think Steve played a good role. He'll continue to play a good role from the outside. You know, obviously, you want to be near the, near the center of influence, which is the Oval Office. I'm sure, you know, had the circumstances been different, you know, Steve would have liked to stay on. But once you saw General Kelly come in and sort of try to right the ship, he, you know, Bannon being a good military officer in the past, he saw the things were going and he decided to play a, a be a team player uh, and, and move forward with everything. Bannon, Dan, also told the Weekly Standard that he believes things are about to get worse for President Trump. He s said this, there's about to be a jailbreak of these moderate guys on the Hill. I mean, we've seen that over the past few days um, in terms of their response to Charlottesville, um, that what is Steve Bannon acknowledging here? What is, the, what is Bannon trying to message here? Well, I'm not entirely sure. Um, I'm, I don't really have a mind up with Steve Bannon, thank goodness. But look, I think things are about to get worse. It, it, tr Trump's relationships on the Hill have never been worse. They were never great. They're worse now. And September is going to be a really hard month. They're going to have to make a very hard decision around the debt ceiling and the budget. And that, one, that is going to be a real test. And I've been through those with a much better functioning president with better relationships on the Hill, and they were hard then. So I, it, you have that, you have the Russia probe looming, you have a lot of things. I think this is, this is going to get worse before it gets better for President Trump. Uh, what do you think, Brian? Do you think things are going to get worse before it gets better? Yeah, listen, the presidency is always challenging, and I think people rise to those moments and people rise to those challenges, and I have the same expectation of President Trump. Obviously, you know, you have the debt ceiling, you've got some key deadlines looming, but yeah. I also think you have a team, you know, under the leadership of General Kelly, who's sort of worked out the kinks, and they know what their focuses are, and they're going to achieve those focuses. I mean, the president here didn't come to Washington, D.C. to sort of get along with the Tea Party crowd or the cocktail hour. He came here representing the people, the vast majority of the, of the, of the people here in Washington, D.C., to disrupt it, to change it, to fix it. And right, I, and but it's, he's got to work with problem. somebody now. If he's making conservatives mad, he's making moderates mad, he's got to find somebody to work with. You know, it's, it's not a function of working with D.C. It's a function of informing D.C. what the American people want. I mean, I think that's what people forget about. Everybody thinks we come to D.C. and it should revolve around D.C. And in essence, this country should revolve around what the majority of the country wants, and they want change here out of D.C., and I think politicians forget that sometimes. But to get things through, to get that agenda through, you've got to work with Congress. I think that's, that's my only point. Yeah, you, Guys, you, you do. And, I, and, and yeah. the president has partnerships and friendships there, and sometimes, you know, they, they clash a little bit, and it's a healthy process. You know, the, the electorate, you know, the president. Little bit. Clash people. a little bit. a little bit. That is one way of yeah. putting it, Brian. Great yeah, to see you, Brian. Yeah, he endorsed Jeff Flake's opponent. Brian, yeah. So. yeah. Brian, yeah. Great to see you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Out front next, Bye. Bannon is already back at Breitbart. Will he use the website against Trump now? My next guest knows Steve Bannon. What's his next move? And just how much did this play a role in Trump's fury at Bannon? Can I have my desk back? Trusted name in New Welcome back to Outfront, and we're following the breaking news. Steve Bannon is out and already back at Breitbart News, the right-wing website that he once ran. A source telling our own Jim Acosta that Trump's chief strategist was given the option to resign, but was forced out. Out front now, the New York Times reporter who broke the story, White House correspondent Maggie Haberman. Maggie, it's great to hear from you. Um, we already are hearing some strong words from Bannon. Um, he's free. He's back on his weapons in this interview. Do you think the White House is uneasy about those words? Uh, I think the White House made a calculation that it was still better to not have Steve Bannon in um, than the risks that he poses from the outside. Um, but I think that there are a number of White House staffers who are concerned about the havoc that Steve Bannon could wreak. And to your point, he's already laying down the marker of the presidency as we knew it being over. That is a, a clear signal uh, to Trump's supporters and the base that elected him uh, to not see what goes forward uh, and what happens next as something legitimate. We know that Steve Bannon clashed with a lot of people in the White House. In this Weekly Standard interview, Bannon blames the thwarting of his plans to the white, the West Wing Democrats. Um, take us inside the White House. How toxic were those relationships there? Oh, oh, they were pretty toxic. Uh, <laughs> I mean, what you what you read is is pretty accurate. Look, I mean, you saw this interview. The final straw for Bannon this week 
Um, and, and look, I mean, I think there was some psychology at play here. He is not a dumb man. He called a reporter who he'd never spoken to before um, and proceeded to talk, um, you know, for however long it was. Uh, about his views of the war, his views of North Korea, and his views of officials like Gary Cohen. And Gary Cohen, the president's top economic advisor, has come to represent uh, in, in Steve Bannon's mind exactly, you know, what is wrong with this West Wing, or at least that's what he has said. That feud has been roiling for months. Um, it was hard to imagine that people were going to the White House every day working together. Bannon had been in something of an isolation of his own making uh, recently um, and just sort of living outside of a lot of these meetings. Some of them he was not invited. Some of them were by design. Um, but now, you know, he is fully out of there. Mm -hmm. And while he has communicated to several people that he has no plans to attack the president, I'm not sure how else you can interpret him saying the presidency as we knew it is over. Bannon's also skeptical of Trump's um, ability going forward, I guess, in the Weekly Standard saying, saying this in part, I just think his ability to get anything done, particularly the bigger things like the wall, the bigger, broader things that we fought for, is just going to be that much harder. I mean, do your sources in the White House see things that same way post-Bannon? No, look, I mean, most people in the White House have been trying to minimize Bannon in one way or another. Uh, over many, many months. Uh, you know, he had formed his alliance with Ryan, Ryan Priebus, and you saw sort of this domino effect where Sean Spicer was gone, and then Ryan Priebus was gone. Bannon was supposed to be gone around then, but he hung on for a while. But you have seen a lot of pushback from some of the people close to the president, suggesting that this, and then this gets back to April when he was first feuding with her, um, this idea that he is the puppet Trump has always chased at. But Bannon is very clearly framing it that way, that he was the key driver, that if these things don't happen, it's because of his absence. In reality, a lot of these things were going to be pretty heavy lifts. I do think Steve Bannon is correct in making the case that he was the person who had really driven uh, the president's uh, earliest policy moves, like the travel ban. Great to hear from you, Maggie. A lot more to come on this. Really appreciate it. Out front now, Robert Kuttner, he's the man who conducted that controversial interview with Bannon that a White House official says left President Trump furious. He's the co-editor of The American Prospect. And also with us, CNN senior political analyst Mark Preston to digest more of this. Robert, your interview is cited as one of the last straws, if you will, for the president when it came to Bannon. Did you get the sense at the time that what Bannon was telling you could bring him down? Well, I got the sense of somebody who was very full of himself, who was very reckless. First of all, reckless in thinking that he could call a, you know, an editor of a, of a well-known liberal publication and talk almost as if we were having a private strategy conversation, not bother to even say whether this was uh, off the record, and somehow think that this would play to his advantage. The other thing that's really bizarre, I mean, Maggie broke the story that uh, there had been a resignation letter two weeks ago. And here Bannon is talking with me, inviting me to the White House after Labor Day, and talking as if he's still going to be in charge of trade policy. Both things can't be true. And I certainly trust Maggie's reporting on this. So you wonder if, if Bannon is giving this kind of a last hurrah, uh, pretending that he's still going to be there, knowing that he's going to be out, or if he knows that he's going down in flames, and what the hell, he might as well say what he thinks. And I think uh, this kind of hubris, this kind of grandiosity, may not serve Bannon well as he tries to jam the president in his uh, reinstated role as chairman of Breitbart, because you can't really have it both ways. He can either continue to be the president's confidant, where the president you know, calls him at 2 o'clock in the morning and talks strategy about how far to go with neo-Nazis and, uh, and, and, and nationalist extremists, and, 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 and Breitbart isn't, I mean, Bannon isn't in, but he's still Trump's confidant. Or you can have uh, Bannon uh, at Breitbart kicking the president in the shins. It's kind of hard to imagine that he can do both things. And I think the single thing that annoyed Trump more than anything else is being upstaged by staff. We saw this with Scaramucci. There's, there's room for only one Trump at the White House. It's one thing for Bannon to advise Trump. It's another thing for Bannon to think that he is Trump, to, to, to have the the same kind of grandiosity that his boss has. 
So Bannon, trying to have it both ways, I think is playing a very risky role here. Mark, uh, of course, a lot of questions now about what is next for Bannon. He's back at Breitbart tonight, but what are you hearing? Well, uh, he's back at Breitbart tonight and has gone back in, in a really a ball of fire, right? And, and they certainly have played it up very hard on their website. But in addition to that, I heard that Reince Priebus, the former chief of staff, uh, who just left a couple weeks ago, and Steve Bannon had been talking about potentially forming a media and political firm. Now, the talks that they had were very much in the nascent stages, uh, but that very well still could happen. Uh, just because he is heading up Breitbart doesn't mean that he can't go out and also try to do some kind of a political firm as well. So mm. we'll be looking to see what happens in the next couple of weeks to see if Reince Priebus, who left a couple of weeks ago, and Steve Bannon, who is now out, will come together and form some kind of political firm. You know, Robert, um, in your interview, Bannon clearly contradicted President Trump on the president's messaging on North Korea. He also made it seem like he had the power to hire and fire pretty much anybody he wanted in the administration. Um, we hear that that is one thing that bothered President Trump for sure. What do you think Bannon's point was, though, then in telling you that? He's a smart guy. Well, <laughs> yeah, he's a smart guy, but he's a grandiose guy, and this is a classic case of hubris. I mean, to think that uh, contacting me and trying to ingratiate himself with me and uh, thinking that I could be some kind of an ally uh, regarding his preferred policy on trade is a little crazy, because you can just imagine uh, Steve Bannon going into a meeting at the National Security Council, pitching a harder line on trade and say, hey, guess what? I got Bob Kuttner on my side. I mean, that doesn't exactly enhance his credibility with the rest of the administration. So I think this is Bannon um, forgetting that his loyalty is supposed to be to the president, Bannon being the kind of freelance, as he's been so often, that has gotten him in trouble with his colleagues, gotten him in trouble with the president, and not being able to restrain himself. My, my takeaway from that conversation was, here is a guy who is incredibly full of himself, very clever, very smart, but uh, given to uh, severe lapses in judgment. And that whole interview was one lapse in judgment after another in terms of the indiscreet things that he said. And he also tried to have it both ways in terms of whether that interview was on the record or off the record. Mm -hmm. First he said there was a misunderstanding, this was supposed to be off the record. And then a day later he's bragging in an interview to the Daily Mail that it was deliberately on the record to divert the media's attention from from all of the uh, you know the controversy about Charlottesville well yeah. that didn't work very well if that was his intent so he's one of these people who will say anything who will contradict himself from one day to another day he also you know said all these disparaging things about the far-right base which he really created as as Trump shocks uh, shock troops and expecting that the editor of a liberal magazine, The American Prospect, is going to be gullible enough to believe that. So He's a very odd duck. A complica complicated man, maybe we'd say. Mark, one of the things, and many folks note it quite often, that irks the president maybe more than anything is if someone steals a limelight from him. Mm. Steve Bannon has certainly gotten yes. a lot of attention. He got it early on. He's definitely getting it today. I mean, starting with the Time magazine cover that happened in February to how Bannon was portrayed on SNL, uh, if you need a reminder. Here it is. Okay, Donald, that's enough fun for tonight. Can I have my desk back? Yes, of course, Mr. President. I'll go sit at my desk. Yeah. <laughs> it's so much fun. I love it. Yes, this is fun. Here's the thing, Mark. Both of those big things that people have pointed to happened back in February. He survived six more months. Um, why wasn't he able to survive this one? I think that things just kind of built up uh, to the point where there was no return. And, you know, there's a possibility, too, uh, that this was done. When you talk to people, I should say there was an inevitability after Reince Priebus left, after Sean Spicer left. Uh, or had announced he was leaving, mm -hmm. that Steve Bannon was going to be the next to go. So there was an inevitability, I think, amongst us in Washington uh, that Steve Bannon was not long for the White House. But there is something to be said, too, that potentially that it was done today to try to change the narrative that has been disastrous right now for Donald Trump, and that is that 
Donald Trump is a racist based upon the remarks that he made that really tore at the fabric of our nation regarding what happened in Charlottesville. All we've been talking about today is Steve Bannon leaving the White House, and he is a very important aide, make no doubt about it. I would say this, though. We shouldn't take our eye or our ear off of what the president said earlier this week regarding Charlottesville, because that is a much bigger story that has long-lasting consequences, Kate. It absolutely does. Gentlemen, great to see you. Right. Thank you Good so much. Point. Out front next, Democrats tonight demanding that President Trump be censured for his Charlottesville remarks. The effort gaining steam. Be right back. Breaking news, Steve Bannon fired from the White House and back at work at Breitbart. In an interview with the Weekly Standard, Bannon says this. At one point, I'm definitely going to crush the opposition. There's no doubt. I built an effing machine at Breitbart, and now I'm about to about to go back, knowing what I know, and we're about to rev that machine up and rev it up. We will do. It comes after one of the site's senior editors, upon learning of Bannon's firing, sent a simple one-word tweet: "War." Is it a threat? A warning? A promise? All of the above? Out front now. Chris Buskirk, he's the editor of American Greatness, and Kurt Bardella, he's a former Breitbart spokesman who is now the president of Endeavor Strategies. Great to see you both. So, Kurt, Bannon is back at Breitbart, says this about revving up the machine. What do you make of it? Well, I don't think he ever really left Breitbart, which is why it was so seamless and quick for him to go from one end of Pennsylvania Avenue down to the other uh, and be on that editorial call tonight. I think what you're going to see really is a liberated Steve Bannon. You know, this is not somebody who's meant to work for somebody, to serve at the pleasure of somebody. He's meant to be his own boss, his own figure. And I think that you're going to see now that he's outside of the West Wing, outside of the chain of command, he's going to be able to resume the life that he had before and dictate whatever he wants. I think that means bad news for folks who are left behind in the White House, people like Jared Kushner, Ivanka Trump, Gary Cohn, the, the so-called uh, West Wing Democrats, as he refers to them, and really bad for congressional leadership. Speaker Ryan, Senator McConnell, other senators like Jeff Flake, I think they're going to come under immense fire from Breitbart and Bannon. And while Steve talks about wanting to be able to help the president from the outside, I think what he means by that is uh, help remove all of the barriers that Steve perceives exist uh, that are preventing Trump from being his true self. You know, when he talked about that weekly standard story, mm -hmm. you know, the president that we voted for, that, that we supported, you know, is gone now, that presidency is dead. I, I think that speaks a lot to what you're going to see in the future from Steve and from Breitbart. So, Chris, you spoke to Bannon just this week. Um, where was his head at then before all of this went down? You know, he was, I mean, it, Steve is always an, an, an energetic guy. And this week, I just thought that uh, that was taken up to 11, if you will. He was uh, he was ebullient. He was effervescent. He was full of ideas and plans. And uh, maybe, maybe he knew this was coming. And so now we know why, because he was full of plans, looking forward to a time when he could go forward and uh, advocate for Trump's agenda. Kurt, can I single in on the editor's, uh, the editor's tweet, war? Um, of course, everyone's going to wonder what that means. Well, the editor spoke out this evening, and he said this. That depends entirely on President Donald Trump. If he sticks to the issues on which he was elected, if he fulfills the promises that used to hang on Steve Bannon's wall in the West Wing, then I think you'll see positive coverage not just from Breitbart News, but from other conservative media outlets. However, if this becomes an Arnold Schwarzenegger situation, where he swings to the left in an attempt to appease his critics in the media and the Democratic Party, then I think you will see a war. If it does come to a war with the president, um, what does that look like? Well, I think it looks like a lot of the negative stories that have, the mainstream media has covered that folks like Breitbart have ignored or tried to really run cover for that cover all of a sudden goes away. Maybe you start mm -hmm. seeing some more stories about the Russia investigation on the pages of Breitbart, which has remained fairly silent about it. Uh, maybe you see some stories pointing blame at the agenda that the president's unsuccessfully trying to put forward. More stories highlighting negative poll numbers, perhaps. I think that the block and cover element that Breitbart has really served for this you know, better part of eight months now, I think that could go away if, if Trump doesn't do what, what the Breitbart and Bannon team think that he should. Now, It'll be very interesting to see how President Trump responds to this threat. Now, remember, a lot of what put Bannon in the doghouse was the idea that he somehow was responsible for Donald Trump. Trump hated that he was on the cover of Time, hated that he participated in Josh Green's book and got kind of co-billing uh, uh, you know, on, the, on, on the cover. 
if Trump decides that I'm going to show Steve and I'm going to be my own guy and I'm going to do some things directly opposite Steve to prove my dominance, because again, Trump's an egomaniac and a narcissist, it could create a lot of friction very, very quickly. Uh, Chris, you venture to guess Breitbart versus the president, who wins? Well, the question really is whether or not the president and the Republicans in Congress are going to fulfill the promises that were made last year during the election. When, when Steve Bannon says, I'm going to go back to Breitbart and I'm going to, I'm going to advocate for the president, he means he's going to advocate for the principles and the policies that the president ran on. I mean, right now, all we have left in the, in the West Wing is really neoconservatives and, uh, and Democrats. And if you're smarter than I am, if you can tell the difference between the two. And so Steve Bannon was seen by the base as the person who represented the president's promises, the agenda that he ran on. So I don't see a war between Bannon and the president. What I see is a war by, by Breitbart trying to advocate for that agenda that got Trump elected. Gentlemen, great to see you. Thanks for the perspective. Really appreciate it. Up front Thanks, next, Kate. top Democrats moving to formally condemn Trump for his Charlottesville remarks. Would censure really mean anything? Be right back. Just like magic, progressive gives you options based on your budget. <laughs> You ever feel like cliche foil characters scheming against Hello everyone, I'm Kate Baldwin. President Trump under siege from all sides, it seems, from Democrats and now a growing number of Republican lawmakers and now Mitt Romney and also now this morning a heart-wrenching rejection of the president. It comes from the mother of Heather Heyer, the woman who was killed protesting the white supremacist rally in Charlottesville. Susan Bro, of course, is her name, and she spoke out this morning and says after the president's remarks Tuesday, she no longer wants to hear from the president. I have not, and now I will not. Um, at first, I just missed his calls. Uh, the, call act the first call, it looked like, actually came during the funeral. Um, I didn't even see that message. There were three more frantic messages from press secretaries throughout the day, and I didn't know why that would have been on Wednesday. And I was home recovering from the exhaustion of the funeral, and um, so I thought, well, I'll get to him later. And then I had more meetings uh, to establish her foundation. So I hadn't really watched the news until last night. And I'm, I'm not talking to the president now. I'm sorry. What After did you... what he said about my child. And it's not that I saw somebody else's tweets about him. I saw an actual clip of him at a press conference equating the protesters like Ms. Heyer uh, with the KKK and the white supremacists. And that is where you are right now because after his statement, after he read his statement on Monday, you thanked him, but now you've had a chance to hear his remarks from Tuesday and that has changed your position as far as the president is concerned and wanting to, to hear from him. Absolutely. You can't wash this one away by shaking my hand and saying I'm sorry. Is there something though that I'm you I'm not forgiving for that. Is there something though that you would want to say to the president? Think before you speak. That's Susan Bro, of course, the mother of Heather Heyer, who was killed. Also this morning, two Republican rejections that may leave a mark on the president. Senator Bob Corker, once on the short list to be the president's secretary of state, questioning the president's competency and stability. Those are his words. And Senator Tim Scott, the only African-American Republican in the Senate, saying that the president has compromised his moral authority. Where do they go from here now? Let me bring in right now CNN politics reporter and editor-at-large, Chris Eliza. Chris, it's great to see you. Add to that list Mitt Romney, of course, weighing in, saying that the president should apologize and is facing a defining moment. Where are we now? Well, yeah, I mean, the truth of the matter is Republicans have to get together to the extent that they can uh, and figure out what they do next. I, I thought what Bob Corker said uh, you should circle uh, and put a star next to because I do think it is important. As you mentioned, Corker, not a uh, reflexive Trump critic no. by any means, someone who has kept an open line of communication with this White House. For him, they use the word stability and competency not once but twice. Uh, in a Q&A with reporters, I, I think is meaningful. Now, 
Um, there are few uh, actual sort of legislative things that the Republican Party can do. They could theoretically censure the president. It'd be uh, sort of a nominal censure. It doesn't carry with it any real yeah, penalty. Yeah. Right. Uh, but that would be a major step, a Republican Congress censuring a president. I don't think we're there. Obviously, I, if I don't think sen we're there for censure, I, I don't think the idea that a Republican Congress is going to begin impeachment uh, uh, on President Trump, and I'm not even sure necessarily w what the grounds would be there. Um, so there aren't that many levers they can pull, but I would say I think doing what Bob Corker did on Thursday is an important step for the party to say it's not just about okay, this is a one-off and we wish he hadn't said it, that there's a pattern of behavior here and that we as a party need to think, uh, consider what we do. Do we walk away from him permanently? Because they've, they've kind of walked away in the past and then shuffled back when no one else was looking. Well, and here's the thing that a lot of folks are thinking about this morning. You know, the comments from the president happened on Tuesday, the latest comments, right? Yeah. Bob Corker speaks out two days later mm -hmm. Mitt Romney now posts this lengthy statement on Facebook three days later at the very least does it show that the president that the president has not been able to turn the corner on this with his own party no he has it and look he's not going to be able to uh, it's certainly in the near term Kate because he won't ever apologize or admit he was wrong he'll consistently say I was right he'll try to change the subject marginally by trying to make this a debate over the removal of Confederate soldiers statues uh, when really it's about his, uh, I think, abdication of moral leadership as president during, Char during and after Charlottesville. Um, so the question is, what else comes up? He's clearly hoping something else comes up that changes the subject. But I do think, look, Donald Trump was never a Republican prior to running for office. He chose to run as a Republican. Uh, he, the Republican Party did line up behind him eventually. Uh, but now I, I do think there needs to be some level of reckoning. I, I think Republicans would be whistling past the political graveyard if they simply said, well, it's August and, you know, maybe people forget about this and they'll move on. This is not an isolated incident. This is who the guy is. And they need to decide how, if and whether they are going to create some distance between them and him or not. Yeah, Mitt Romney says it's a defining moment for the president and a defining moment for the country. Great to see you, Chris. Thanks for coming in. Thank you, Kate. Here with me now to continue the discussion, Keith Boykin. He's a former Clinton White House aide and Democratic strategist. CNN political commentator and Republican strategist Anna Navarro is here. And Ed Martin, former state GOP chairman in the great state of Missouri and also the author of the conservative case for Trump. Great to see all of you. Um, Thank you. Let's get to the politics in a second. Um, Ed, I do want to ask you, though, and everyone's been able to hear now the comments yeah. from Susan Bro and <clears throat> Hire's mother this morning. Yeah. What's your reaction to her mother? I mean, if no other comment matters, sure. if no one else's comment matters, shouldn't Susan Bro's comment matter? Shouldn't the president listen to her? Yeah, I mean, I think, and I think he will. I mean, I, anyone that's buried a child, and I know that probably viewers w viewing this know that it's something that's beyond the comprehension and deserves a lot of respect. And I think what we're seeing is a tragedy. I've heard the president say it over and over that I don't think anyone should, of all the things that happened, all the terrible things that happened that day, the one that stands out is that woman losing her life. That's a mother. That woman has siblings and kids and all. So sure. On the other hand, I mean, you know, we're, you're, you're saying we're not talking politics. It's being used as a political argument. I, I, I think her first response to the president's statement was, thanks for reaching out. Now her response yeah. was, I'm frustrated. I, I'll tell you this, I, I've been in this situation. You go through a lot of emotions that I don't know how I would handle them publicly. And I think we deserve, it deserves respect, but it, it sounds to me like you used it at the beginning of this hour as a political cudgel, not as something about well, morality me? or... Yeah, you got I mean, you I used it. it as a political cudgel. No, I played right. what a what a grieving mother said well, you, CNN, on TV I mean, you, today. You, you, this yeah, is what she it, said. So this is her explanation, Ed. She said that she did put out that statement. That was after his comments Monday when he named and disavowed and you know named and named and shamed white supremacist groups. She said when she went then and looked at the clip of what he said Tuesday, right. this is now how she feels. You don't right, think, you, that, you Kate, don't think Kate, that we should no, play her comments? No, I, 
No, I, I do, but I, you're saying that the, we're, you're saying we're going to put aside the political conversation till later. If you buried a child, Kate, I can tell you this: when you first hear your child died, you don't think to yourself, "What do I think about what someone comments?" The first thing you say when someone comes up to you, Kate, and says, "I know what you're going through when your child dies," you know what you think? You don't know what I'm going through, and you whip back and forth in emotions. So the idea that CNN would put at the top of the hour this clip and say, "Look at that! Isn't the president wrong?" When you lose a child, you don't. Get Get to have a political calculation foisted upon you by CNN or anybody else, you're trying to recover. And yes, we ought to honor her, but we ought not to put it at the top of the hour and pretend that Saliza is going to make it authoritative that the president's wrong. It's not Ed, fair Ed, to Ed. her. What is yeah, he Ed, about? I, I'm sorry. I, I in, in no way, and I'm going to bring everyone in. Okay. The fact that you don't think that Susan Bro's comments deserve to be what at I the said, top Kate. of a show. That's not what then, I, that's well, not you're what also, I said. Ed, you're also that's saying I'm using, I'm using her comments Correct. to make that a political is what I statement. Said. Absolutely you, not. Kate, I'm making Kate, you no preface, political statement, Ed. Kate, I'm you saying, prefaced my, you pre prefaced the turn said, to me by saying we're not going to talk about politics. We're going to talk about something else. Yeah, You're it's emotion, talking about politics. Emotion. I'm you not. Think, you brought it in. You say, okay, we're talking circular now, Ed. Stick okay. with me. Let's bring right. in some other voices. Anna, your thoughts. <sighs> <laughs> that was a hard. Uh, that was that was hard to listen to as somebody whose parents have buried a child. I don't think any of us can label, uh, you know, a parent's reaction at that moment. Not everybody acts the same. I think Miss Bro exactly. is acting with incredible exactly right. composure. I think she is uh, speaking from her heart. I think she is speaking as a mother, and I think she's speaking for so many Americans who today are hurt who today are in pain for the death of Heather Heyer and everything that it represents, the symbolism of it, uh, and who feel solidarity for this mother, who feel solidarity for this woman who died in this act, protesting and defending American values. So I congratulate her, I commend her, I respect her, and I hope we all remember her daughter, her daughter's name, and that she died in defense of American values. Um, Keith, your take on this? Um, I, I agree with what Anna said. Um, I think that uh, this is a, a tragedy this woman just endured, and mm -hmm. uh, I don't understand why we would judge or critique her or critique CNN for putting no, this on the news. Um, no, it, it, it's just it, this is what I've been getting now for a few days now that no matter what happens, it's the media's fault. But it, we, I mean, I'm, obviously, we're quite well, I, used to it. You asked me to respond to her. Look at the let first me just part finish, of my Ed, response. For God, Ed, you spoke forever. Let me just speak for a so, moment. I, um, I recall at the Dem at the Republican National Convention last year, uh, mothers uh, from the victims of Benghazi, at least one mother who spoke, and it was a. It was an emotional moment, but it was also a political moment. Um, and so the idea that Republicans are now saying that the victim of a tragedy cannot speak about that Nobody tragedy said because that. it might Nobody be political. Said that. Or you that it should not be news. Well, Ed, you're, you're, you're well, let me finish Nobody and then you can that. tell me why you Nobody think I'm wrong. Nobody said that. Just hey, hold on and oh, let, let down, Keith finish the point and then, you'll have, then you can respond. I promise. The, the, the point is, we have we've just we've just gone through a national tragedy. We're still living through this tragedy. We had a woman who was killed in Charlottesville. We had white supremacists, Nazis marching through the streets, chanting "Blood and soil, Jews will not replace us." And we had a president of the United States. We have a president of the United States with no moral clarity when he speaks about this. It takes him days and days to to talk about it. And when he finally does talk off the cuff about it, he reiterates his initial statement that caused so much grief for the the families of those people who were victimized. I, I don't think there's any leadership from this president, and that's the more, that's the more fundamental issue. Uh, I do want to talk actual actual politics, um, but Ed, you right. can respond. Well, I, I'd be, it's like Groundhog's Day to listen to Anna, listen to you, listen to everybody. Everything is the president's fault. I, I don't really, I, I Ed, never said, oh, wait, wait, wanna, I'm not, I, you said I get to respond. A mother right, but should be honored. We should listen to her. Coming on my show what to I, just blame and shame me, what, why do you do I, it? I, I, I'm just trying to ask all some questions. I, all I said was that when you put up that quote, you're, and then say we're not going to talk politics, we're going to talk about something. We're talking about politics. That's all I said. And you guys are Kate, using her statement Kate, as politics. That's okay. But I, I, I you this asked is me what to Susan respond Bruce, to a mother. Kate, I did. This is the part. This is the. Part